I, I entitled this talk Perspectives on UK BIM uh, Learning Outcome Requirements uh, because although I'm a member of the UK task group and have helped develop these, some of the things I say are my perspective and the view we're getting as we begin to develop these ideas. Uh, so I'm indebted to my mem fellow members of the, the UK BIM task group, but uh, uh, th these are perspectives and things you need to think about when you're talking about how we build our skill in becoming digital engineers. And by digital engineers, I don't mean engineers that are digital, like robots. I mean engineers that actually are digitally literate. And for engineers, you can read architects and planners and all the other disciplines that actually uh, work in, sorry, okay? Work within our construction world. So just a little bit of summary on the journey so far from the perspective that we've had in the UK and, and some of the influence that, uh, that, uh, that, that we've had uh, and what we call level 2 BIM. I'm not going to describe what that is apart from it's file based federated and actually uh, gathering information together uh, in, in, in a way that's pragmatic that we can do today. So we, uh, as a, uh, a, a government, started this strategy back in 2011 uh, to say we were going to adopt as government departments Level 2 BIM by 2016. And our hypothesis was this, that the government as a client can derive significant improvements in cost, value, carbon performance through the use of open, shareable asset information. And my colleague down here actually knows how I stress this, that that doesn't talk about sharing BIM models, although that might be part of what you do. It's about sharing information. And that really is the core of what's happening in this new world of digital engineering. And it's great to come to a conference that's called Digital Construction rather than BIM. It's, uh, I'm, I'm so totally tired of the word BIM, uh, and it, it doesn't really describe what we do. Uh, and you can see the things that we wanted to do all the way through this was to keep it open, we wanted it verifiable, etc., etc. And we had this industrial strategy that actually BIM was part of, that we wanted to get this to make us produce lower cost, faster delivery, lower carbon emissions, and improve our exports as we all want to do. But this strategy, was, and BIM was part of it to, to be able to do that. So the government BIM strategy was very much this, to be good at buying data as a client, as well as buying the physical assets that we procure. To do it consistently, and to leave the how up to the supply chain because we pay the supply chain to be clever and innovate and actually be able to deliver that. And so we mustn't put too much on the supply chain. And we put an early warning out for them to mobilize uh, to, and we started to provide some training but also to actually say some of the trainings are there. But we also said we're gonna produce some methods and documentation. So we have this push-pull strategy that actually says we're, we're, we're going to pull from the supply chain and get you guys to align behind us. And to do that, and you don't, I won't go through these in detail, we, did, we produced a number of documents, a number of standards, a number of protocols that we built this whole thing on. Uh, and if, uh, and uh, as we went through, we also found that that we had to grow that package of information because there were things we hadn't thought of when we started the whole process. So for instance, we, we, we started out uh, not knowing that we really needed a firm plan of delivery work to actually anchor this process to. And finally, we came across this problem of security and actually sharing these huge information models uh, in such a wide way that some of them might actually be so secure that you didn't ought to show them to everyone. 
So if we're actually showing alignment of major services, for instance, uh, then you know, we, we need to be very clear that we're not giving that to terrorists and all sorts of other things. So we actually have added a security module to this. So that's the package. I'm not going to go to it in detail. But I will start from where I left off at this conference last year, and I make no apologies to those who were here last year, uh, that actually this is, the, this is where we are. Our goal in doing this is to move from actually be areas where we produce lots and lots of information, word processed, handwritten information, CAD drawings, dumb paper, that's been our background for ages and still is in many, many cases. And we have data buried in every one of those bits of paper or every one of those bits of proprietary information that sits within those systems. And that data, if you want to query it, probably only resides in a, someone's head or on a bookshelf or, or, or in filing cabinets or if you're, you're lucky in a document management system that actually says I need to drill down into this document management system and find out all that information. And uh, it, I won't say what I feel. Document management is not what this is about. Document management just picks up the deliverables and actually distributes them. That problem is, and we all know this as an industry, a tide of paper, a tide, a tidal wave of information that actually we need to cope with and need to be able to analyze and need to actually see. So we're moving to a process whereby we have clever people and clever software because we mustn't miss that out. And that, those clever people uh, and that clever software produces data, information that we can store in a structured way that we can federate together, bring together and be able to report from and produce drawings, produce model views. Uh, we can ask queries of this, what, why, when, where, how. All of those things we can, we can do and that's the world we're moving to. So it's data created, modeled, edited, stored, published, viewed and queried from a structured data set. That's where we're moving. That's where BIM is going. That's what, what, what this is about. And so we're moving from information locked in drawings and reports to ca checked, captured, life cycle data published in different views, drawings, specs, bills of quantities, uh, schedules, work breakdown structures, sequences, etc. Uh, uh, into those things. And very interestingly, I'm currently working with High Speed 2 in London, and that's the sort of thing we're looking at, is how can we extract all this information and make it available across the project so that everyone, those guys that are doing uh, planning with Primavera, those guys that are doing costing, uh, those guys that are doing mass wall diagrams, we want all that information available to them uh, and not just on bits of paper. So from documents and data, to data and information, from drawing to writing and publication and information. And the whole process behind this is liberated data. Too long we have let the proprietary software guys lock the data into a piece of proprietary software that actually says you've got to go to this software to go and get the information. And if we, if we can liberate the data and actually make it available, then we can facilitate digital engineering and digital construction. And again, it's a, it's a repeat of what I said last year, the B matters very little. The M does matter because it's about management of this information, but the most important aspect about this is how do I collect, how do I validate, how do I coordinate, how do I bring information together that's useful across the whole project. So the I matters, as my colleague down here will say. And that whole thing is made up of technology. Let's not belittle it. Technology is enabling what we're doing. It's a made up of process. How do we do it? What steps do we take? It's made up of contract and commercial stuff. We've got to get the legal stuff right. It's made up of standards. But very, very importantly, it's made up 
and actually delivered by people. So if we actually want this to work properly, then the training and upskilling and development of all of our resources and our people becomes extremely important to making this happen. And this is a problem statement I picked up from someone else's slide actually is we've got technology in process we must not ignore the people element in our BIM approach. The only way to get trust across this is to be able to trust each other and if we trust each other then we'll start to trust the information that we have. And so I would say this that people interacting with technology, let me go, there's lots and lots of stuff that you can do with people interacting with technology and doing the stuff that we do with the wonderful software that we're actually getting delivered that, that, that do 3D models and clash detection and all sorts of things like that. But people interacting with people supported by technology is really cool. That's really where we want to be. And that's the problem in actually how do we get people trained and skilled up to do this. Being information intelligent requires information to be viewed in a whole manner, to balance the whole thing out with the capabilities of people to improve and performance. So I just want to, as that is an introduction, that's the problem that we have to solve. I just want to look at some of the issues that surround the problem of how do we do this. And first of all, I think we need to recognise that actually this is about asset information. If we're actually talking about planning new jobs, thinking about them, designing them, constructing them, and then managing them, we need to look after the life cycle of the information about those things that we build, manage and operate and strategically plan. So this is a life cycle thing. It's not just design, it's not just build, it's the whole thing. And we have lots and lots of players that go all the way through the life cycle, be they designers, be they planners, be they builders, be they uh, fabricators, be they constructors, um, even right round to demolition, the whole, the whole circle. So we've got to say this information flow looks after that whole life cycle and so we need to look at which stakeholders that are involved, who they are, why they're involved, when they're involved, uh, and actually look at this life cycle cost thing because actually a very small percentage, uh, someone else put those numbers down, I'm not sure if it's 25%, but actually it's a very low cost when you look at the overall operation. But if we bring this together holistically, we can do some work that changes the cost of operation by doing things very early in this process if we have the right skills. And uh, typically we do value engineering these days at that end and actually what we really should be doing is uh, virtual building design and value engineering much earlier on. So who are the players and who do we need to train? Well, the interesting thing is this, that the world of BIM has been very much teaching people to use software that does three-dimensional design and actually parametric design and putting information into that design. And so they live somewhere in this matrix, but actually involved in this process are lots of other players, what other stakeholders. The client, the employer, it's too long have we actually had, I don't speak for Lithuania because I don't know, but employers that actually when they start out and say, I want you to do BIM, and you go, okay, what do you want me to do? Um, uh, well, I want you to do BIM. And you say, well, what information do you want from me? And so there's no clarity in education, even in the employers, apart from the fact that someone's told them BIM's a good idea and BIM will save them some money. We have pro program and project managers that need to make decisions every day about the delivery of a project. We have tier one leads that actually do design 
uh, or construction, we have subcontractors, we have other specialists. We have a whole array of people that need to be upskilled in this process. And where does each player fit? Well, we've got a whole thing. If you actually start to look at the life cycle, don't look at the detail, it's a diagram I pulled from elsewhere, but we go through a project. We explore it, we develop it, we deliver it. And, uh, and so that not only are, is there a depth of people, but also there's a breadth of what do we do when? Where, where, you know, at the planning stage, we don't need masses of detail. We, we need much bigger thinking. At the detail stage, when we're doing handover, we need very detailed information about what we hand over. So we've now got a matrix of depth, which you can add to that list, Paul, by the way, and breadth as we go through a project and through a life cycle to say every part of that matrix needs to be upskilled and brought on board. And the problem we have had is actually most of what we have called BIM, and again I'm not speaking for here, I'm just speaking for where, where, um, where, where I know, is actually sat in this um, tier one design lead and a little bit of construction. And the rest of it sort of sort of hangs on and says, well, I need, I need to know, but how do I know and what does it do and where are the benefits for me and how does it all pull together? So you know, we've concentrated a lot on that red bit. And so what we are doing and attempting to do is to move from a 3D model, early BIM, lonely BIM I call it, which is building information modeling used by just part of the team to deliver visual information, related data on a single proprietary model and it's just 10% of the project information. To actually real BIM, which is business information management, intelligent management of the project, information that all the project state stakeholders can bring to and have better decision making through the process. So if I do have an environmental engineer, they can go and get the information, draw it out, do some work on it, do some analysis on it, and make those changes. So the required people and skills are, need to reflect that. And what we know is that people don't like change. There are so many people that you come across and you introduce these things to them and actually they look back at you and they're basically saying in their eyes, we don't do change because it's too difficult. So actually getting the people even to change thinking and overcome those barriers is extremely important in this process. And the change will come by upskilling the workforce, the whole workforce, which includes the management of every one of the companies that we're involved with or the organizations we're involved with. Uh, we shouldn't be having to try and do business cases to management. They should be saying, here's the business case, go and do it. Uh, the clients, the design organizations, uh, the construction organizations, fabricators, product suppliers, that's the big picture and the big issue that we have to face and the big Thing that's looking us in the eye and saying this is what we have to do. So do we train people to use 3D tools? When I started doing my course in BIM at the University of Surrey, uh, we actually sat down and thought what should we do and the students were saying we want to learn how to use XYZ software. Let's, we're, in, we're in Scandinavia or near Scandinavia, we'll call it Tecla uh, or something like that. We want to know how to use that. The more we started to look at this, we thought, that's the last thing we want to do. We don't, that, that's something they can do themselves. We want to train people to create data, to build, to use, and analyze information. To make the real change, we need digitally literate engineers. Engineers, and by the way, for engineers, we read architects, planners, and whatever it might be, so I'm not trying to just say engineer, it just happens I'm an engineer. Uh, we need desperately the knowledge and skill of the engineer. 
how things work, how things hang together, how they work structurally, how, how the, the environment works together. That's important knowledge for everyone. But we also need now engineers and architects who actually know about the data that they're producing and using so that they can manipulate and use that data and extract knowledge from it that they can build on. And so we are looking to say that actually we thought the IT boys were all the analysts and clever people with data. That's now a knowledge that engineers and architects need to actually be able to do this. So for them, data and data manipulation is just as important as it was for an old person like me to use a slide rule to do engineering calculations. It's a very important tool. And we mustn't just leave it to the IT specialists. This is about engineers who know how things work and start to use the data. And that's what we need to train. So we need digital managers, digital engineers, digital architects, etc., etc. That's the background. So what we did as part of the BIM task group uh, was to look at a learning outcomes framework. A framework that we could put together that says if you can teach people and get this as an outcome, whether you're developing a university degree or a master's degree, or you're upskilling your workforce or you're upskilling your management, then this is the framework. And we want it to be as simple as possible, but we actually need to make sure it covers everything. So we have published a draft framework, which I'll tell you how it's available in a moment. And I'm just going to go through very quickly and summarise that framework. If I go through it in detail, it's extremely dry. Um, uh, but actually, I just want you to get the import of it. So uh, the, the framework actually works under three headline topics. Understanding what BIM is. The context of BIM. And because we're doing level two, we have to put level two in there and its connection with the government strategy or whatever strategy it is we have. Second is understanding the implications of that for my business and for the area I work in, to understand the value proposition and to understand the requirement for data exchange and the supply chain and the client. So understand that overall data exchange, data build-up process uh, and, and, and how you work with it. Um, and I really will read these fairly quickly because I think it, you, know, you can get, take these slides away and, and use them. But the, to, to understand what BIM is, we actually say we, we, have peop we need people who understand collaborative working, to understand that we're doing it to reduce waste and errors, that we're doing it for whole life. We have a thing called soft landing. Soft landing is difficult to interpret, but when you understand what it is, it's easy. And that is that we need to involve those that maintain and operate any asset that we build very early on, because they can tell us lots of good stuff that actually should be in our final product. So, you know, for instance, you know, if, I, if I design a bridge and the bearings I can't get to because I can't maintain them, uh, and, and that's, that's in my design, then if I have that, then it, that should be got rid of very early on. So the aim is to actually produce stuff that actually gives us all the information we need at the end of the process for the management of it, but that information has been intelligently developed through the life cycle. To understand the roles and responsibilities of the client, the supply chain, uh, to look at the external international context, so to look at building smart, open geospatial, uh, all the other standards that actually need to be there, uh, look at the barriers to adoption and the value of quality data and the principles of data management. So let's stand there and last in the list, but the principles of data management are core to what we're trying to do. So in understanding our value proposition in your organisation, just looking at the organisation we're working with and saying, what are the implications? What change do we need to do? How capable are we and how do we change that capability? So having a good, honest opinion of your capability, being able to judge uh, a capability. What technology and what technical interoperability requirements that there are? Uh, and very importantly, 
BIM has turned out to be a very interesting topic in terms of how do we run our organizations, projects and companies. It has turned out to be a driver for business improvement because we sit down and say, why did we do that? Why do we do that? What do we need that information for? So it's a very much a, a business change driver as well. Looking at the legal and commercial implications, which are obviously very important, uh, looking at the value and benefits, and of course, looking at the potential security threats that actually are the threats within the organization, but threats outside. So the third part is understanding our, our, our data exchange requirements, uh, understanding the purpose for the, for the design and build operation phases, uh, the requirements for exchange of information through the supply chain, uh, the roles and responsibilities in the supply chain and clients. How do you do a BIM execution plan? How do you plan to execute BIM through a project? What information needs to be delivered? So what are the information requirements as a driver? What are the organizational information requirements, the asset information requirements, the project information requirements, which is what the employer says, here are my requirements. I'm going to tell you very clearly what I want. And by the way, for employer, read not just the client, but read the tier one contractor, the subcontractor. They must feed this information down very clearly because otherwise they'll not get good information back. Um, implications on working methods, technologies, contractual interventions, how do we intervene in this contractually? One of the tests that we're having to look at now is actually we're, we're changing the way this works. How do we incentivize the contractor to actually give us the benefit of BIM as an employer? How do we make sure that they don't just capture that and don't give it to us, but then how do we be fair to them as well? Uh, one real uh, nasty is who owns the information and who owns the intellectual property rights to that information and we need to be very clear about that in our process otherwise we get into arguments to say I'm not going to share that information because someone else might steal it or steal my ideas or all sorts of things like that and finally for security policies now those are the headline lines that appear in that horrible matrix there uh, that actually gives you the headlines of what we say needs to go into a, a, a training upskilling process and what the outcomes need to be. I don't ask you to read it. Go to www.bimtaskgroup.org. It's there. You can pick it up and you can read it for yourself and read the background. So, that's what we want in terms of outcomes. This is, I think, an even more difficult problem. Who do or what do we certify? Very difficult. Because we are seeing something happening which I'm not sure is right. We're seeing BIM specialists being certified. People who actually say, well, you know, I'm a BIM practitioner and therefore I can be as part of this job. What I've just said all the way through this process is actually BIM is actually the bloodstream of all that we do. So everyone in our projects are BIM practitioners. Let's not build a BIM profession. Let's build a profession that actually is a set of engineers, a set of architects, a set of planners who know how to use BIM data and know how to use BIM. So we're not going to invent a new profession, I hope. I'm worried that we might. So do we, do we certify the individual? Do we certify the role? Do we certify the process, the organization, the project, the client? I think actually we probably have different certifications for each one of those. And they're all inc incredibly important. And they are questions that we need to be settled on as we do certification. So the current UK landscape, uh, no matter what you hear, is that there is no official certification to level two. A number of organizations have got training courses, including the Institution of Civil Engineers, which I personally deliver, um, that test, uh, test, and 
test your knowledge and validate attendance, but don't give you a certificate to say you are certified what, I don't know. Some test knowledge, some have branded certification, uh, and, and, and some are endorsed and some aren't endorsed, and some projects now are beginning to look at I want people to be certified to work on my project and therefore I'm going to take you through a process that certifies you in the way we do it in our project. So on the question of certification, I think the debate continues and it's, there is a huge danger in lots of commercial organisations saying, well I can do a certification and I can do a certification and how do you get the endorsement of that? I think that's a debate that continues and I, I, I'm not finally with the answer. I'm sorry it doesn't answer your questions probably, but that's where we are. So I just want to say this, that having said you know, what we're looking for are engineers that are digitally literate, actually be able to manipulate data, extract information from data, do all sorts of things with it, rather than just do 3D models then I, I, I think that that's where we are in level two and it's a very data centric and requirement centric capture process. The journey however does continue and we have this uh, strange thing where we've done and said well where we go next is level three BIM. And level three BIM is what? Well actually I'm not sure we know. I hear lots of organisations saying, well, we're level 5 BIM or level 3 BIM and fully integrated. And then you ask the question, well, do you exchange open data and open information? And the answer is invariably no. So, you know, they're not sharing data. They're actually saying, I can do level 3 within this little parcel. So, one of the things that we've actually looked at and studied is what do we do about this because it's much bigger and different than we initially thought it was. And out of that has come a, a, a report that's called Digital Built Britain. I'd be very interested to compare it with the thing that the Swedish, you were saying earlier, uh, which actually sets out a vision for level three. And it puts it into the wider context of a smart world. So smart world, smart cities, which we hear lots about, but smart grids grids of, of power and, and water that can respond to the, to the needs uh, as seen. Integrated transport solutions and something we hear so much about is even worse than BIM, the internet of things where we've got transponders and, uh, and things that actually respond to us. And it sets up a framework and, uh, for research and development to take that forward. But underlying it is again another buzzword, but actually does probably capture what this is. So when we've got our structured data and our unstructured data, when we've captured that data through our processes and we've got it into somewhere we can use it, then this turns out to be big data. Data that we can analyze and add. Um, we were hearing earlier the metrological information to or geological information to, or social studies to, all of that data can be brought together. And so, when we're thinking about how do we upskill people, how do we train people, how do we get people to this area, that's the goal we're taking them to. The graduates and masters guys that come out of our universities today will not be doing things as I did it, but they will be producing data, big data, that they can analyze and lots of other people can analyze and use and that's the, 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 the skill set that we actually need to build in our, through our process as well as training all the body of people that we're, we're doing now. So thank you very much. I hope that's